Hi, I'm Melissa. And I'm Jesse. Welcome to the Reimagine Success Podcast. We're a husband and wife team who want to make a difference and change the way we all view success. We've had the privilege of interviewing so many amazing, talented, and successful guests. Each one of them experienced success in their own way. We want to change how society views success by inspiring you to live your best life and celebrate your successes no matter what that looks like, big and small. Success looks so different for everyone, and we want you to reimagine your success. Welcome to Season 2 of Reimagine Success. Welcome back to Season 2 of Reimagine Success. Hey, everybody. Hope you've been having an unbelievably successful week. Uh, This week for us has been just another crazy one. We just can't escape the craziness. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was on a plane uh, Wednesday heading to Pittsburgh, and then I drove up to Cleveland, Ohio for a woman's event, Um, actually two events this week, and they were just amazing. The speakers and the quality of all the content that they were putting out was just so incredible. I learned so much, and a a lot of the women that, that were in attendance learned so much. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited to do, do more of these events. Yeah. And then Melissa got back Friday night and then Saturday we had to go for a concert of mine that was just (laughs) incredible. And so just always, always something in our lives, keeping us incredibly busy. And we're just, we would have it, we wouldn't have it any other way though, because it's just, uh, it's awesome. But we did Sunday get to take a day where we organized our house. We finished unpacking so many boxes that needed unpacked. So great. Our garage, actually, you can pull a car into the garage now. (laughs) <laughs> we, we made so much progress. And so what I want to say about that is sometimes you have to take a day yeah. and do things for yourself and yes. put everything else aside. There was work we could have done, yeah. but we said, you know what? We need to take a day for us to do the things we need to do around the house. And yep. that's important. It's, it's success. very important. You know, we, we feel very successful that our house is much more unpacked than it was. And organized organization, <laughs> us OCD people over here. <laughs> Well, with everything that we are talking about, I'm really excited to get to go into today's guest. Oh, yeah. This, I, this one, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Actually. Yeah, we've had it on the books for a while, and we are finally here. The day has arrived, and we would love to go ahead and introduce him. So today we've got Greg Lawrence on the podcast. Greg is a psychedelic integration and transformational coach in Los Angeles. In addition to his private practice, Greg serves as an integration coach for the Transpersonal Center in Los Angeles and various retreat centers. He's been facilitating integration circles for psychedelia in Los Angeles for over five years and is a member of Inner Space Integrations Provider Network. So welcome to the podcast, Greg. We are so excited to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're so excited to dive into everything that you're doing now. And uh, let me just say, you currently live in Los Angeles still. Yes. Okay, awesome. So I lived in LA for about four years or so. Um, I started off up in Eagle Rock, and then I made my way to downtown for a little bit. When it was cool, there was a lot <laughs> of like little parklets and stuff going on. <laughs> I know I I drove through there not too long ago and I was like, Ooh, it looks totally different around here. (laughs) Well, I'm in uh, San Fernando Valley. So I'm like a suburb of Los Angeles, but I just, I love Los Angeles. Oh yeah. I I love the weather. The weather is beautiful. I just got to go for the first time back in November. Uh, We went, uh, I'd never been to the West coast Mm -hmm. at all. And uh, we went to Comic-Con out in San Diego for Melissa. She has her own comic book. And um, then we, she took me on a tour of all her old spots in LA and we just went all over the place. It was super cool getting to see that side of the country. Nice. Um, so Greg, why don't you, uh, just start by telling us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your story, what got you into everything with psychedelics and, uh, we'll go from there. Uh, well, how I got into psychedelics has to do with my story, I guess. So, uh, I am a psychedelic integration coach. That means I work with people before and or after a psychedelic experience because Mm -hmm. of legal reasons, obviously the middle part they do themselves, but I don't Mm -hmm. give people illegal substances. I'm not a guide. I'm Mm -hmm. a coach. So beforehand, I'll help people prepare. Uh, We'll talk about why they're coming to the medicine, what they're looking for, help them set and refine intentions. It's a very important part of the process. Mm -hmm. There's some exercises we can go through to help people sort of get more out of the experience. And then we'll talk about things like how to stay grounded, navigate, what to do if you become upset or frightened, because that's also a very important part of the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're basically trying to help someone get as much as they can out of the experience. 
Afterwards, we talk about that person's theme or lesson, and there is always a lesson in a psychedelic experience. Mm. It's not always to figure out, easy to figure out, but there's always a lesson. Mm -hmm. And then we take that lesson and decide, what do you want to do with this? How do you want to make it a part of your daily life? Mm -hmm. So I use tools from cognitive behavioral therapy, neurolinguistic programming, a lot of different personal and spiritual development philosophies and disciplines, and a lot of tools that I've developed myself over the years that I've used myself and use with many clients. So um, in my teens, through my late twenties, I used psychedelics along with just about anything else I could get on my hands on that would alter me or my consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, the now, idea now did, to get- Can I sorry, ask you about that real quick? Did you do that as a party kind yes. of thing? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so you, the short you, weren't, answer you weren't on a spiritual self-discovery journey at the time. At the you beginning. Know, there were things that I discovered about myself in general and my place in the universe, but, you know, it was really to get altered mm -hmm. um, in many different ways. And unfortunately, in my late 20s, I got mixed up in hard drugs. My life spiraled out of control very quickly, and mm -hmm. I found myself kind of at rock bottom. I don't know what would have happened to me if someone had not pulled me out of the physical environment I was in. Mm. Right. Um, I moved away from the area I lived in. I cut ties with all the people I'd been associating with and basically cold turkey. I quit using everything except for cannabis, which I abused for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, about 10 years ago, my life turned upside down. My wife at the time passed away. We'd been mm -hmm. married for 23 years. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the grieving process, I uncovered, well, I mean, somehow I knew it was there, but I just came, became very conscious of the fact that I had a lot of childhood trauma mm -hmm. that had never even been acknowledged, much less addressed. Mm -hmm. So I started working with a psychologist for all things mental and coach for all things spiritual. And somewhere in there, I was smoking cigarettes at the time. And I told my coach, I wanted to quit. And he said, I heard that psilocybin helps with that. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, I know about mushrooms. So I got some mushrooms and I took them. And the difference, here's where intention comes in. You know, mm -hmm. before I wanted to see what was going on outside of me and have fun. Well, at this time I had turned my attention inside myself. And when I did that, that's what the substances did. So mm -hmm. far from what I was expecting, I got to see, you know, kind of my life replayed some of the traumatic events, what I had done, what other people had done, why I was stuck in the patterns I was in all kinds of things about my life. And when it was done, I said, well, now that I've seen that everything's going to be different. And in about two or three weeks, everything was the same. Mm. So rinse, repeat a couple of times. I kept having these epiphanies and these profound insights about myself and my life that somehow they weren't translating into any kind of changes or transformation. Mm. So I started investigating and found out about the uh, concept of psychedelic integration, which I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. I knew mm. nothing about that. I started digging in. I attended an integration circle and I started meeting people who did this. And I started studying the different ways people work with psychedelics. And I started sort of holding my own integration methodology, the way that it worked for me. I eventually started leading those integration circles. That's what I've been doing for over five years now. And mm -hmm. about four years ago, one of the integration coaches, I was doing some counseling at the time as part of, you know, leading these circles. And I was doing some energy work at the time. And one of the coaches said, can I refer some clients to you for integration work? And mm -hmm. it seemed to be something I took to. I shortly after that got a uh, certification as an integration coach. Mm -hmm. And about four years ago, I started practicing. And two years ago, I closed my old business. I owned my own business. And two okay. years ago, I got to that critical mass where the universe kept saying, hey, I have this work for you. And I kept saying, well, I'm kind of busy with my business. And I finally <laughs> said, oh, oh, I get it. Okay. So I started just, doing that work and then I just shuttered my business. Also curious, uh, what kind of business were you in before all of this? I had an IT staffing agency, which mm -hmm. is basically like a high-tech temp agency. Okay. So, so very different yeah. line of work. Uh, yeah. It's, it's about as different as you could possibly get. Right. <laughs> but 10 years ago, before I went through this, I was a very different person. I was very angry. I was not centered at all. Mm -hmm. um, and not done with a lot of it, dealt with a lot of issues I had. And I had a lot of blind spots. So I would have had no business counseling anyone about anything. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it makes total sense because when you, when you're out in the world, the world is so chaotic that when you go inside yourself, you really have to deal with everything that you've been through, through your life and all of the emotions that of everything that this world causes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like you really learn like who you are yeah, and, absolutely. and you, you completely change. Like you almost do a 360 of who you used to be and who you are now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So 
you said you started practicing uh, about 10 years ago, you said? Um, uh, as a coach, about four years ago. About four yeah. years. So you've been coaching four years, that, which is super cool that you've been doing this for this long. Yeah. And um, in those four years, have you seen like a lot of people's lives transformed and like what was some of the like results that you've seen come from people beginning to use psychedelics in this way? Well, um, there's a lot of hype around psychedelics and you hear, for instance, about all the clinical trials for depression, OCD and anxiety and end of life anxiety, PTSD. All of those trials include a significant therapeutic component before and after the actual experiences. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, by far, for the most part, the amount of success or change that you see from someone as a result of a psychedelic experience has to do with the amount of work that they're willing to put in afterwards, because mm -hmm. the psychedelics will show us what it is that we might want to shift or change in our lives or what kind of things we might want to do, but it's still incumbent, incumbent on us afterwards to actually do that work. And right. This is where I was when I started off. I thought, well, I'm just going to see these things and now things will change. Well, I had to put myself into some uncomfortable situations and set boundaries and make decisions about people I had in my life and what kind mm -hmm. of things I wanted to do and say, mm -hmm. and learn to speak my truth and a lot of different things in order to see the benefit from the things that I had seen. So wow. I have seen incredible transformation in people's lives. I've seen people who are like me, completely different from the way they were. Mm -hmm. Most of those people did a lot of work in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. I've also seen people who, you know, work with psychedelics and didn't want to do anything with that information. And that's, you know, everyone's a choice, but nothing much changed for them. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there are times when someone might get done with an experience and something transformative happened. All of a sudden I make my bed every day. I'm less impatient in traffic. I might relate to people a little bit better, but by far the most of the time it's in what you do afterwards. Yeah. Now, you know, do you, the, do you coach them afterwards? Are you in this process for months after they go through the initial treatment or do you do the initial treatment? And then you're like, these are things that you need to work on and they're on their own to do that. Well, uh, in my work, I mostly, you know, people may come for, I have people who come for one session who are in trouble. They had a oh, difficult right. experience. They don't understand it. And they're kind of freaked out. And right, they, right, right. Some people come to me in uh, acute situations. Some people come to me, they say, hey, look, I'm going to do this. I want to work with you before and after. I usually recommend three to five uh, sessions afterwards mm -hmm. because we're going to see what happened with you and what sort of you're presenting with yourself because you're a co-author of this experience. You know, the the substance is sort of the chef, but the pantry is you and your life experience. Right. Mm -hmm. So everything that comes up in a jury comes up for your healing. It comes up for you and you've sort of given to yourself in a way. Mm -hmm. So what happened for you and what do you want to do with that? And how do you want to do that? So sometimes that involves taking baby steps and maybe setting a boundary with someone. Sometimes that involves examining certain areas of my life and figuring out if that's working for me and why not. Sometimes mm -hmm. that involves changing some bad habits, patterns, ways of being and thinking. And sometimes that means someone that's going to be on a spiritual path and discover their place in the universe and what it means to them. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. have people who I've been working with for years. Um, I have people who call me once. And I have people who call me a few times and move on from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, is everything in person since this is a psychedelic treatment um, or do you do any of this therapy online or virtually or through Zoom or anything like that? Well, I would say that I'm not a therapist. I'm a coach. Yeah. A coach. Um, it's yeah. all, it's all before or after the experience. So mm -hmm. no one's altered during, and you know, since COVID happened, almost a hundred percent of my work has been online. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I figured that that all went through online now. Now, yeah. If you were in a legalized state, so like I know that uh, Colorado, I believe, is now legal with psychedelics. And Oregon. Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you were in one of those states, would you actually be more of a, I, I hate to use the word shaman in this sense, but, you know, like a shaman, like somebody, a guide guiding yeah, people. I think you're talking more like a guide or sitter. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm not so sure this, the, what I do is different from that. So, yeah, I mean, I have sat with friends. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's something you do when you know about these things. I understand how psychedelics work. I understand what to do with someone in their experience. But my experience is primarily in coaching people before and afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, so we, we, okay. So <laughs> uh, I did this two weeks ago on our podcast with cannabis. I, I came out of the green closet and now I guess I'm going to come out of the 
uh, psychedelic closet as well, uh, live on our podcast and just say publicly that I am pro psychedelics. I have used them. I think they are unbelievably beneficial there. It's out there for the world. There's no going back. I'm not going to edit this out. So there it is. Uh, with that being said, uh, my whole life, I've always been told you better stay away from that stuff. That is bad news. It'll make you go crazy. It'll make mm-hmm. you jump out of windows or claw your skin off or, or um, see bugs or, yeah. crawling around or spiders. Yeah, or- It'll ruin your brain. You'll end up with schizophrenia, like all these uh, negative, th- negative mm-hmm. associations have been put on this much like with cannabis and other drugs that can be extremely helpful to people. Um, what are like, how do you view some of these negative things that people say about psychedelics and the, the bad things they can do? Do you, do you see any stock in that? Like, are there, are, are there risks that are like serious, terrible risks that are associated with it? Or generally is that a lot of propaganda that people came up with years ago to try to keep people away from a drug that actually could help them? So um, I'm someone who believes very much in harm reduction. So I'll say right out of the gate that psychedelics aren't for everyone. Mm -hmm. And not everyone should take psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Certainly anyone with a diagnosis or history of schizophrenia Mm -hmm. for themselves or their family should be very cautious and probably stay away from psychedelics. People who are bipolar, Mm -hmm. there's some debate about that now about which psychedelics might help that. But generally, those people are advised against taking psychedelics. There are certain medications that don't blend well with certain psychedelics. So people should always, always, always do their research. Mm -hmm. Having said that, Psychedelics do not cause mental illness in people who are not mentally ill. Mm. Um, Psychedelics do not change your chromosomes. They don't change your brain structure. They don't make people jump out of windows who are psychologically healthy. That's definitely part of the uh, drug paranoia and uh, propaganda of the 70s Mm -hmm. of the war on drugs. It is possible for people to have, have for bad trips. However, I would say that sometimes that's because, you know, some of those are from people who are taking medications that don't mix well, people who are in states where they shouldn't take psychedelics, or people who are not prepared for the fact that, you know, sometimes frightening or disturbing things might come up during a psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. Not people coming after you with knives, but (laughs) one of the qualities of psychedelics is that they go into us. Well, first, let me say that everything in this universe has a life cycle. It's born, does a certain thing, withers and dies. Same thing goes for emotions. They come up, they go through us, we experience them and they're gone. The problem is we can stop those halfway. So if something difficult and I'm scared and I don't like it, I want to stop. I turn my head. I don't feel like dealing with that right now. I may dissociate a little bit. That thing's not going away. It's not dead yet. Mm. It's going to go inside of me. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us have these things built up inside of us. One little painful thing after another, you know, it's manageable for a while. And, you know, it's like the closet getting full, the closet's getting full. It's no big deal. And pretty soon you're holding the closet closed because if you let go of the door, things are going to come flying out of there like they were with your garage a week ago. Mm -hmm. So psychedelics come in and they see these incomplete experiences in us and they say, look, you need to go through this. This is bothering you. And I might be scared. I might be sad. I might be taken through grief. I might be very afraid, but these are feelings that I had already. I'm just completing and it's getting them out of us so that they don't bother us from inside anymore. So it's possible to have something called a bad trip. It's also possible that that bad trip can be contextualized and can be very valuable to you in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, there's almost nothing worse than going into a psychedelic experience and seeing every crappy thing that you've said and done in your life. That's a brutal experience, but it's very helpful for people because there are a lot of things as you alluded to in the beginning, that we don't want to accept about ourselves and our lives. And the more we can accept that, the more that we can accept ourselves, our lives, what's happened, what we've said and done, no matter what we think of it, the sooner we'll read a state stage where we're more healthy and more ourselves. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Do you think that everything that we're holding in in our lives is contributing to depression and anxiety and stress and fear and, you know, people not living to their fullest selves or their best lives. Um, Do you think that a lot of that is actually, actually contributing to everything that we're, we're seeing in the world today? Absolutely. You know, this is not a society that is the same as it used to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the kind of neuroses we go through now are really uh, sort of a symptom of the society that we're in right now. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, we live in a society that is a consumeristic society. And, you know, I make money, I buy things, I get it. Uh, But this society is designed to make people buy things. That's how this thing stays alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, you need to go back and realize that in the early 20th century, some people did research and found out a couple of things. They found out that people buy things for uh, psychological emotional reasons and not for value. It's like, I don't care if this is bigger and it costs less. What's my neighbor going to think about me having this? How Mm. am I going to impress women with this? How will I look if I have this? How will I feel if I buy this thing? Yeah. They also discovered that unhappy people buy more stuff. Mm. So they're trying to fill their void. Absolutely. So the media that we consume, the sitcoms that show people at each other and how husbands and wives just hate each other and don't get along and Mm -hmm. women and women are completely different. The mm-hmm. magazine covers that show us people with unattainable beauty and keep us going after someone who's a perfect person. Yeah. And it's just an image that we've been showing on our head. All of these things lead to people not being as happy as they can, but that's by design. Yeah. We're supposed to be like that. Add to that the fact that we are no longer tribal. It used to be that when kids were growing up, you know, they were sort of exposed yeah. to all kinds of different people and everyone yeah. did the same. And when you look around in nature, you know, insects, animals, everything kind of raise our offspring the same way, pretty much. Bears are pretty much brought up the same way. Fish brought up the same way. Kangaroos, you name it. Mm-hmm. People, however, have the power to make decisions and we have free will. So while there's a recipe that goes into raising a healthy human, we're able to add or subtract all kinds of things from that recipe. And mm-hmm. when we are small and things happen, we sort of break them off and put them away and we carry them around and nobody says, okay, to let that go anymore. Mm-hmm that you don't need that now. And our body has a mechanism for holding on to trauma and distorting reality. So yes, absolutely. Those things that are stuck inside of us are causing people to be very unhappy and relate in ways that are not good for them. Yeah. And a lot of what you said uh, falls in line a lot with the goal of our podcast, you know, uh, our podcast. Not keeping up with the Genesis. Yeah. That's our whole thing is Mm -hmm. get rid of those ideas that you have that you have to have this car or this house or this boat. And that equals success. This bank account. Yeah. Like people put all this pressure on themselves to mm -hmm. live up to this ridiculous expectation. And what I love about psychedelics is it strips all of that away and you see yourself for you Mm -hmm. and it gets rid of that ego part of your brain and just shows you your barest, most pure self. And then like, you can start seeing things so much differently. Um, I'll just do a short testimonial. Uh, my first trip I did, um, I was battling big time with depression and self-loathing and just thinking that I wasn't good enough because, um, I I didn't feel like people accepted me for me and that I always had to be something else besides Mm -hmm. who I really felt like I was. And for years, I just kind of did that um, just in the back of my head, you know, subconsciously, I was just keeping myself down. And when I did my first trip, all of that came out of me and I realized how, how squashed I'd been and how, how little I'd made myself to appease everybody else. And And then I just started actually like discovering for real who I was. And it was the most liberating thing ever. And now, like, I feel like I know myself better than I ever have before. And I've only been on this journey probably uh, going on three years this March. Um, I started this right in the time of COVID, uh, did my first trip and it it changed everything for me, which was kind of cool because I got to spend a lot of time by myself discovering myself afterwards. So I was able to do the work that went along with it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it really, it really changes your outlook on who you feel like you should be. And that can be scary a lot of times because then it, like you were saying, it takes real work. It takes real, it takes dedication to the work to, to, to do it every single day. When you have your real life, you have jobs, you have, you know, demand the house, you have to do everything that you have to do on the daily, but you also have to work on yourself constantly. And it takes a a commitment. Yeah. And so one of the things that we picked up in our lives to help with doing the work post psychedelic trips is meditation. Um, Is that something that you practice or encourage people to practice? What, what does that post trip work look like uh, for any of your um, coaches, uh, 
<laughs> I was going to say patients, but you're not a doctor clients. and don't claim to be I a doctor. Clients. So clients. Okay. clients. <laughs> certainly meditation is one of the tools that we have in our toolbox um, at any time, but certainly after a psychedelic experience, because one of the great things about the psychedelic experience is it quiets that voice that's in our heads all the time. That voice that is so critical of us, mm-hmm. that's wrong so much of the time, that thinks it knows everything, that changes its mind a lot. And if there were a person around you who acted the way that this voice in your head does, you'd probably run from that person yeah. and mm-hmm. stay away from you. Yeah. But for some reason, it's normalized in our heads that we should constantly be criticizing ourselves. Yeah. But quieting that voice for a while has a lot of value. You know, stopping the talking in my head is a very valuable thing to do at any time. So meditation is good. Mindfulness and embodiment are two very valuable tools that we take uh, take part in after a psychedelic experience. Mm-hmm. Experiencing myself as being in my body and feeling what's happening here mm-hmm. and being aware of what's going on as much as I can. You know, it's something I slip out of constantly, but I have to bring myself back. Am I paying attention to what's going on or am I off in the future or the past? Yep. Can I feel myself in my body or am I just not aware of what's going on from here down? Mm-hmm. Because that happens quite often by design. So all of those things are definitely what some of the things that we bring forth in the work afterwards. The other parts of it, what a person might work on in their life is a very customized approach that I use from you know, with different clients. I like to meet people where they are. I don't have too many cookie cutters or uh, template approaches. I like to find out what's happening with the person, what works for them. And then we work on that in a moment. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and yoga is another thing that we do. We try to do daily regularly, um, but it also really helps you feel what is going on directly in your body. So whenever you feel pain, whenever you feel something as you're doing movements with yoga, um, we found that that's very helpful to keep yourself present and in your body as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, any of the mind-body uh, linking exercises like yoga, tai chi, qigong, things like that are always mm-hmm. very good practices because it does teach you that this and this are connected, which we mm. forget. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's so funny because like, I, I love the exercise of thinking about, okay, I'm going to raise my hand. Now, I'm not really thinking consciously about me raising and lowering my hand right now. My brain's just doing it, Mm -hmm. you know, because my subconscious works on these levels. And then I I apply that to a lot of my life. All right. What is my brain having my body do that is just subconscious actions? Like, what are the things that I'm, I'm not even paying attention to that are going on within my physical body or within my within my mind, you know, Mm -hmm. that, that, that little voice that you're talking about that I'm just allowing to happen, not thinking about, you know, that I'm just raising my hand up or putting on your seatbelt or something, you know, just just just... these simple actions that sometimes can be really detrimental to us. If we're not careful, you know, the the little things that we do day in and day out, the things that we tell each ourselves day in and day out, the way we, we think about certain Mm -hmm. things day in and day out can be extraordinarily detrimental to ourselves. Well, words, words are so, I mean, words are like spells. They cast everything that you are saying about your life. So if you're constantly saying, you know, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm not worthy, I am, you know, all these negative things in your head, then you that's what you're going to become because words are so powerful. But if you change your mindset and you say, I am successful, I am, you know, worthy, I am loved, I am giving, and you change the way that you communicate. And even within our minds, it just changes so much about your life in general. Yeah. And I I think that psychedelics is like a big spotlight that just like beams it down on that one thing and says, Hey, you got to stop doing this. This is hurting you big time. And uh, so, but what is it about psychedelics that actually promotes that, that mental well being and healing? Like what do you, is, what's the science behind that? If you could go into that at all. Well, outside of like the pharmacology or method of action or physiology, I will say that psychedelics do, as I mentioned earlier, have us complete and complete experiences. They have Mm. have us feel through things that we've experienced in our life and didn't want to complete. They help us see things that we didn't want to look at before. That's very difficult. I mean, almost everyone cries when they're under the influence of a psychedelic at some Mm time because we've all got tears built up inside of us. Oh yeah. You know, my face was people. leaking the last time I was like, I'm not even like feeling like I'm crying and my face is just dripping water for no reason. Yeah. That's because you're getting to feel the experience without having emotion intrude in and tell you that this is bad. 
Mm-hmm. It's just a thing that's happening to you. And this is one of the things that sometimes psychedelic shows that we have feelings in our bodies. Those are the mm-hmm. raw sensations that happen in our bodies because you can't feel an emotion in your brain. Mm-hmm. Your brain does the thinking. So it tells you you're sad, you're angry, you know, uh, you're disappointed, whatever. But that all starts with a sensation or a combination of sensations in your body. Then your brain jumps in and tells you what that means. That's mm-hmm. where emotions come in. Mm-hmm. But psychedelics take us through these feelings and emotions and they help us complete it. They help us get rid of this baggage and they also amplify things. So if you are around someone who you have some problem with, that is going to be amplified greatly when you're around them. They're just, they're just going to be someone that you can't stand being around possibly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have, so if people have nonstop mind chatter, that might be amplified 10 times to where it feels like you're going to tear your hair out. And they realize I'm going through this every single day. Sometimes it amplifies our patterns. Mm. Sometimes it amplifies emotions to get them out of us. And sometimes it just shows us like, well, that's a thing for me. A lot of things that come to us during the psychedelic journey can be compared to what some people get as regrets on their deathbeds. Mm. I really should do this. This is what I need in my life. Here's what it is about that interaction with that person. Here's something I don't want, need, or like something I do want, need, like, or deserve. Mm -hmm. So all of those things can lead to some sort of transformation. But once again, that usually means that you need to do something in the aftermath. And it's important to understand that doing something different is going to feel uncomfortable, probably going to feel a little bit forced and going to feel like it's not going to work because energy wants to go in the same direction. It's always gone in. So when we try to modify, replace, or learn a new habit, pattern, way of being, or thinking, our brain jumps in and says, this isn't a good idea. Because our brains think it would be a very bad idea for us to change, Mm -hmm. including our bad habits, because they're there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's comfort too. You know, those are the things that we are comfortable with, even if it's a bad habit, because that's something that we do every single day. So it's really hard to, what, what would you say the best way to change a bad habit after an experience, you know, this is a bad habit, you know, you shouldn't be doing it. You just went through this whole process, but now you're at home, you're, you're back to your daily grind and you, you have to overcome this. What's the best practice in order to overcome a bad habit? Well, I mean, there are all kinds of you know, methods for going after habits, you know, like micro habits and things like this. But really one of the main things you have to understand is that I can evaluate a situation. I can analyze, I can discuss with people, I can read and do research and come to a conclusion that this is absolutely what I need to do. It's different from what I'm doing now, but this is definitely what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And when it comes time to do it, an emotion comes in, usually fear, Mm -hmm. and it feels like it's full of information. Like for some reason, maybe I shouldn't do this right now when there's no new information. So we have to understand that when we go into this, we need to know that, okay, I've I've decided I wanna do this. I may be scared and it's okay to back away right now, but understand that there is no information in that emotion that's coming over you. That is just discomfort. And that the more you do this and the more you repeat it, the less discomfort you'll have. And after a while, you mentioned putting on a seatbelt. You do that so many times that now when you put on the seatbelt, you don't even notice. That's because our minds, take over these things, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. after we, you know, when you get into a car to drive for the first time, you think this is impossible. How am I possibly going to be pushing on the brake and the gas and looking in the mirrors and steering the thing and looking for cars? (laughs) It just feels like there's no way this is going to work. And now you don't even think about it. You're talking to someone for two hours. You don't even notice what's on the road. That's because (laughs) after a while, when we do something so many times, our subconscious says, I get it. Mm-hmm. You've done this so many times. Don't worry about how to open a doorknob. I'll just take that over. You go create and interact with people and I'll do all of this mundane stuff like putting on seat belts and opening mm-hmm. doors and driving cars. Well, after a while, when we repeat things so many times, our body gets to know it. Mm-hmm. So when we're trying to form a new habit pattern way of being or thinking, we have to understand that if we keep doing this long enough, pretty soon my body's going to know what it is and it's going to take over and it's going to be a part of me. It just takes repetition and that can take hundreds of times, you know, 30 to 60 days or all kinds of different figures about how long it takes to get a a new habit or pattern into you, but Mm -hmm. it takes repetition and it takes knowing that it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, when you talk about stepping outside your comfort zone, people talk about things like jumping out of a plane, right? Speaking in Mm -hmm. front of thousands of people, sometimes stepping out of your comfort zone is having a difficult conversation or setting a boundary with someone. Yeah. 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 It's very easy for words to come out of your mouth, but apply context to that. And it's that person about this situation. Those words do not want to come out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they're uncomfortable. 
Right. So you're going to step out of your comfort zone. You're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have emotions. You're going to realize, and this is where it's very valuable to feel what's going on in my body, because when I don't like something and I don't want to do something or someone says something I don't like, I try to check in immediately and see what's going on. And I realize I am very uncomfortable in my body right now. Mm -hmm. There are sensations in here that I don't like, but when that happens, my brain cuts me off from here down and starts getting me to try to solve this problem out here. And there is something called, you know, creating a problem by trying to solve it. My brain does that quite often. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's nothing going on that needs to be solved, but I'm uncomfortable. So my brain starts looking for the problem. Is it that person in that situation, that thing someone said a while ago? Um, so just know those things are going to come up and you're going to be uncomfortable and it's going to feel forced and unnatural. And you're going to think after all, this isn't going to work. But if you keep going after a while, those things will become habits. Yeah. You know, it's funny because uh, I've always said the only person who likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, it's, it's almost true because change for a lot of people is so hard for them to do, whether they know that they need to do it. I mean, it could be something as large as having to leave a marriage, Mm -hmm. um, which for a lot of people is, is, is very difficult to do it. You know, you're, it's embedded into our brain. Once we marry someone, that's it. You know, we have to stay with this person. So when we change something so large in our life and we know we need to, I mean, there could be abuse, there could be, you know, mental or, or anything that's going on in your life. And you know, that this needs to happen, but it's so uncomfortable to do something so big that could actually dramatically most of the time change your life. Mm -hmm. And, um, I know I've, I've spoken to a lot of people and I'm actually doing a motivational speaking event soon for some people who actually just got out of probation about, you know, their life and kind of turning their life around. And they really, so, you know, it's you as a coach and, and coaching, um, you know, people to really change their lives has to have so much impact on yourself because I know whenever I, I do a lot of motivational speaking events, I have so much just amazement when people come up to me at the end and they're like, you know what, you said this and it really resonates with me. And I really want to make this change. And this is what I'm going to do with my life. And for you to do this with your clients, you know, on a daily basis has to be so rewarding and, and, you know, just so refreshing that you're making such a positive change in the world today. So we, first of all, have to commend you for yes. doing this and for making huge changes in the lives that, you know, your clients are living and the, the way the world is living. Um, but then also to let people know that change is scary and it is very hard. And it's, it's like I said, only person that likes it is a baby with a wet diaper. <laughs> so, you know, we just, ha- we just want to say thank you, you know, for doing everything that you're doing and, and to keep going because, this is where the world needs to go. We need to, we need to, everyone needs to know that change is okay. And, and it important. is, and it's, it's important and it's okay to do it. Um, you know, so we, j- I just wanted to say that real fast. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my first psychedelic experience actually got me to evaluate a really toxic relationship I was in. And it was really hard for me to leave that relationship. But on the other side of the trip, I realized that I was, putting myself last again, like I always did. And I, I was able to draw hard lines. And then once those lines were crossed again, it was like, Oh, well, clearly I have no other choice, but now to leave this relationship because it's not going to be beneficial to me. But before I did the trip, I was completely blind to all that. And Mm -hmm. I was, I was just tunnel. Not me, by the way. No, 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 no. it wasn't. wasn't Um, I had complete tunnel vision and I couldn't see beyond the one thing that I was, you know, feeling. And then it's like, it took the blinders off of me. And I was like, Oh, I have been treated like garbage. I, I do deserve better than Mm -hmm. this. And I should have standards that I uphold in my own life. And so these kind of trips really, really open up your eyes to Mm -hmm. those sort of things. The problem is, is for most people these days, like, like we were saying earlier, all they've heard their whole lives is the drugs. propaganda. Drugs are bad. They will kill you. Uh, this is classified as a a bad drug. You know, like it's it's on the list. I, I forget which schedule it is. Is it Schedule C? Almost everything's Schedule One. 
Oh, schedule. Yeah. One. So it is schedule one. And you know, that, that means that we're not allowed to do it. So therefore it's off the table. And a lot of people don't even know like what psychedelics are, what, what, what's out there, what options there are. Mm -hmm. They, they probably heard of people doing shrooms or tripping acid. They've heard Lucy in the sky with diamonds on a Beatles song, you know? uh, But as far as like actually understanding the different types of psychedelics and what, what properties they have and what they do most people are completely clueless they just know that joe rogan does dmt and raves about it all the time uh you know like but what that actually means to a person interested in testing out some of these things in their own lives that's where they could get a little scared and and if they don't know how to research properly with this they don't really even know what to look for so when guiding people before a trip what kind of psychedelics do you recommend? Uh, what kind of effects do you tell people that they should expect from this, like durations, that sort of thing? Could you just educate our audience on the different types of psychedelics and what kind of to look for in that? Yeah, I really don't recommend uh, psychedelics to people. I will say that if people uh, aren't, uh, if they're uh, uneducated about psychedelics, a very good book to read is Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. Mm. And that will actually be a series coming up on Netflix where he does cover those um, in detail and different Mm. substances each, I think it's four or five episodes, but there's a lot of information on there uh, about what he found out when he went looking for the truth about psychedelics because he'd heard the same thing. They'd change your chromosomes and make you jump out windows. And he was shocked by what he found. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Michael Pollan, if people don't know, is a famous author, usually around subjects have to do with food. He was one of my favorite authors. He's a great storyteller. And then he came out with this book on psychedelics, which was very surprising to me, but it's from the point of view of someone who's not an advocate and not in the psychedelic community. So uh, it's very educational. Mm. Um, Probably one of the most common, well, first I would say if people are curious about psychedelics, they can test themselves out with other modalities. They can try cannabis, which is Mm -hmm. legal in many areas Mm -hmm. and can be psychedelic, especially Mm -hmm. in a guided experience or a lot of people who work with people guided psychedelic or cannabis experiences now there are things called conscious cannabis circles Hmm. that people have in different Hmm. varieties of that breath work can be psychedelic Mm -hmm. so those two things can help people sort of dip their toes in the psychedelic waters if you will Mm -hmm. one of the most commonly used psychedelics right now is psychedelic mushrooms which contain you know magic mushrooms which contain psilocybin I think the reason they're so popular is because people can grow them themselves. You don't need a chemist. You get a kit with some spores and you grow it. And you know, a few weeks, people have mushrooms. Mm-hmm. It's not something I ever care to do. Mycology is not my thing. Um, I just assume let someone else do that. But you know, psilocybin is physiologically one of the safest substances that you can take. There are more emergency room visits and 911 calls every, every year for uh, aspirin and cannabis than there are for psilocybin. Yeah. So physiologically, it's a very safe substance to take. Again, some people should be careful about taking psychedelics if they have certain conditions, if they're taking certain medications, or if they're in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you check in with yourself and you think, what's the least desirable mental state I've had recently? Can I take that being amplified two, three, four, five, ten times? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. You should check in with yourself with that because that can happen. Yep. Am I okay with knowing I might be very scared or upset? Can I hang in that? Mm -hmm. You know, do I understand that I might not like what I see that I might not just have a good time? Mm -hmm. Um, Do I understand that I might get some hard lessons in this? All of that has to be taken into consideration. Do I have support around? Sometimes a very good idea for people to have a therapist to work with afterwards or someone like me, a coach of some kind. Mm -hmm. If things get too heavy, I'll refer, refer people to a therapist, but People should have support of some kind, hopefully a sitter to be with them who will be sober. There's a lot of considerations to take, take in when you're thinking about psychedelics, but you know, magic mushrooms are certainly very common. LSD is someone everyone's heard about. So with magic mushrooms, you're talking about a psychedelic effect that lasts four to five hours for the most part. With LSD, you're talking about eight to 12 hours. So that's something to take into consideration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Almost everyone's heard about ayahuasca now, mm-hmm. you know? Ayahuasca can be extremely gentle or kind of brutal sometimes. Um, 
Ayahuasca requires most of the time a certain diet before and most of the time afterwards. These are all things people should look into. And ayahuasca is usually done more than one night, like on multiple nights. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, it's not uncommon to find like a, a ayahuasca ceremonies that are on Friday and Saturday night, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the few psychedelics that you do like back to back. Mm -hmm. uh, most serotonergic psychedelics like mushrooms, LSD, so forth, lose their potency almost immediately. If I take mushrooms tonight and then I take them tomorrow, tomorrow they may be half as strong. And after about a week of doing this, they'll have no effect on me whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Ayahuasca actually potentiates itself. The second night I take it, it's actually a little bit stronger than it was the first night. So hmm. it's a bit different from the other ones. DNT, DMT, NNDMT is a short acting, very quick, very intense psychedelic. It's usually vaporized, smoked, like in a crack pipe kind of setup. Mm -hmm. And it is extremely visual, extremely powerful, kind of confusing. And most people forget a good portion of what they experienced in that. But a lot of people like it. Mm -hmm. There is 5-MeO-DMT. That is a substance that people should approach very carefully. It basically, at certain levels, provides instantaneous ego death. So in my prefrontal cortex up here, there is the part of my brain that you know stores Greg, all of my memories and my ideas about who I am. And that mm -hmm. can disappear. The problem is sometimes when your ego is taken apart completely, when it comes back together, that can be kind of disturbing because you watch all of your stuff being put back together and all of the issues. And if mm -hmm. you don't have proper support around there, if you're working with someone who doesn't understand what they're doing as far as a facilitator, and with 5-MeO-DMT facilitators, the most important part of the process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it can be very destabilizing. It's a very powerful substance that can be destabilizing for people. Hmm. So you have all of these sort of standard psychedelics and you have the peyote and, you know, mescaline and things of that nature, um, San Pedro, different cactuses and things like that. Those are pretty much like the standard psychedelics that most people hear about. Yeah. Yeah. And out of those, which have you found is most consistently uh, beneficial for the people that are taking them? Um. You know, NNDMT can be very healing. It has been for me in the past, but it can also be a sort of a rocket ride and you can forget a lot and um, you don't get as much out of it sometimes, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the other ones, you know, it depends on, you know, I've seen people have transformative experiences with just about every, every uh, substance that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once again, it has a lot to do with what you do in the aftermath of that experience. They'll all show you something. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I've, I've also heard a lot of good things about MDMA or Molly or ecstasy as they're calling on the street uh, for um, post-traumatic stress disorders and stuff like that. Um, have you seen people using that and getting through some PTSD? Uh, yes, but with PTSD, um, I'm not so sure about that because the PTSD studies are done by MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychological Studies. Mm -hmm. They are, excuse me, psychedelic studies. They are in phase three trials right now. They've been testing MDMA on veterans and first responders with treatment resistant PTSD since 1992. Mm. Probably in the next couple of years, they'll get through the phase three trials and MDMA assisted therapy will be a prescribable treatment in the United States. Mm. That means that you have to go through someone who will prescribe it. You have to get an insurance company to pay or else you pay yourself. You mm -hmm. have to have the you know, provider available and it's probably going to cost in the neighborhood of 15 to $20,000 for a round of treatment when it comes through. Wow. But MDMA is not so much a classic psychedelic. It doesn't cause visuals the same way that other ones do. It is what's referred to as an empathogen because it invokes empathy in people or an intactogen because your tactile senses are really woken up. You know, you'll mm -hmm. see when they talk about ecstasy, you'll see people with pacifiers and lights and, you know, feeling velour and all kinds of things because your physical senses really wake up. It's a very sensual drug. Hmm. So um, it's also used in underground settings for couples therapy. Yeah. Um, my wife and I actually mm -hmm. have a presentation we do on that called MDMA and couples therapy, the promise of ecstasy. Hmm. But um, people have life-changing experiences with MDMA because it allows someone to hear things that are usually hard to hear. You know, it lowers the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden the signal I get, let's say for instance, you're walking down the street and you see someone crash their car and get out and scream and kick their car. And when you walk by them, you've never seen this person before. And they look at you and say, this is your fault. <laughs> you say that person's kind of crazy and you keep walking and you laugh to yourself. Then you get home 
your significant other knocks over a glass that you left on the edge of the counter and it breaks and stuff goes everywhere. And they turn around and say, this is your fault. Now you're upset. Mm. It's the same words, but it's coming from a different person. It's much harder to hear in certain contexts. So MDMA allows you to hear things that are sometimes difficult to hear and see, say things that are sometimes difficult to say and see things in a different light. So for PTSD, it actually shows people that when I, the PTSD, usually when I talk about the event, I'm taken back to it and it's hard to even get to the therapy part. Mm -hmm. It's been years in therapy, just getting a person to get to the part where they can talk about the incident before you start therapy. Yeah. The MDMA can show them like that was over here and you're here now, so you're safe. Then we can begin the therapeutic process. Mm. So MDMA can be very healing because it can show you things that show you that things don't affect you the way that you thought that they did before. Mm. So now with psychedelics and the amount of therapy and the amount of research that's been definitely going on within the last few years, but um, do you see the legality of psychedelics and say even MDMA? Um, do you see this changing in the next few years? Do you see it kind of opening opening up a little bit more um, for therapy, for coaches, for uses uh, in individual states? Well, in individual states, there have been a lot of states and even cities and localities that have decriminalized psychedelics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which just means that the local district attorneys won't prioritize um, prosecuting these. It right. doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they can't, but decriminalization, I think, is the problem with the decriminalization is it's local. And again, you have the, like the, is the situation with cannabis, legal in California, illegal federally. Right. Yeah. Right. So now cannabis dispensaries out here can't have bank accounts because if they, you know, the bank wires money across the state line, there's a wire fraud charge. Mm -hmm. for it. So um, there are issues with the medical model, like with MDMA becoming medicalized. That means that if I want psychedelics, I have to be, I have to have some tr uh, uh, condition that can be allegedly cured and be prescribed something that I'll pay a medical provider for. Right. If it is legalized, then what happened in California for cannabis, for example, I know people out here who made a living from cannabis working with dispensaries. When it was legalized, all of the big companies started gobbling up the smaller ones. Yeah. You know, the quality of product went way down. Some people mm -hmm. were pushed out of business. So legalization brings in corporatization, which isn't always in everyone's best interest anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Decriminalization seems to, to uh, be the best path I can see right now. Yeah, because it keeps it in the hands of the people. It doesn't mean that I need a prescription for this. Um, I don't have to have an authority between me and exploring my own consciousness, which I should never have anyway. Right. I don't have to worry that it's going to be gobbled up by corporate interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how the landscape's going to change because all of those things are being put forth. But there is a very large grassroots effort in decriminalization across the country right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hope it keeps going. I know we're in uh, out, right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and we just got past the bill to add uh, cannibal, uh, cannabis. cannabis on the uh, legislature. Uh, well, so the, the voting on it, yeah, I believe we, we, we voted to yeah. be able to, to vote, vote on it <laughs> on the legality. of it. Yeah. So, so we're not there yet, but we yeah. are getting in the process of being able to vote on it. So yeah. unfortunately we live in the deep South, the buckle of the Bible belt where <laughs> people don't want to hear anything about drugs, no matter how beneficial they can be uh, because Drugs are bad, of course. <laughs> Obviously, everybody knows that. So dumb. <laughs> well, you know, a, a lot of people, I think you have to be open. You have to be open-minded and mm -hmm. you have to be open-minded for change, especially change within yourself and your life. You have to be open-minded. If you're putting yourself in a box and the only thing that you see is the box that you're in. However, if you open it up and you see what's on the outside of the box, then you're going to see so much more and so much more beauty and so much more that there is in life. So I think mm -hmm. that a lot of people still are, they're, they're keeping themselves in a little bubble in a little box, and then they'll never see the big picture. Yeah. July 31st, a uh, year ago, we got married. Um, so oh. we're coming up on our one year anniversary, but before we did our, our wedding, yeah. uh, the week before Melissa surprised me with a, a beautiful cabin trip. We went out into the woods and in the mountains and yeah. it was just gorgeous. And we did a psilocybin trip there on mushrooms. We had some golden teachers and, uh, 
And boy, I, did they teach us. <laughs> man, we, the trees were giving us the most yeah. unbelievable marriage counseling and yeah. showing us things that were it was just really cool, beautiful, yeah. and spoke to us in ways that I will never forget. And it radically changed my life. It changed the way that I look at her mm. as my partner and my spouse and my companion and all the things that like you should see in the person that you're going mm. to marry. And it gave me just a whole different look and on love and what and life and partnership. Yeah. And so, um, for me, it's just been invaluable. The, the, the experiences that I've had on psychedelic trips, it, it has just changed everything so many times over for me. Yeah. And it's also being open It's being open to being open to, but, to growing, but I'll say that that trip started out really rough for me. Uh, and, and one thing I, I want to comment about things that you were saying is that a lot of people will conflate a difficult trip into being a bad trip. Uh, and what I love that you were saying this earlier is that a lot of these things when hard, it can actually show you things that are really important mm -hmm. to you. Um, I'll, I'll just say mother earth was kicking my butt during that trip and just showing me how abusive we are as people to the planet and the things that we're doing to it. And I won't go into all the detail about everything I saw, but it was, it was intense for a long time and I was extremely uncomfortable, but I wouldn't trade that experience for anything because it, it changed me and it, it made me better and it made me more empathetic and more passionate to, to the and, earth yeah, and, and, and the environment, you know, because that plays a part in everything that we're doing is the, the environment and how we're treating mother earth and, and what we're really, what kind of blueprint we're really leaving behind and footprint. It's um, we have to not only give back to each other, to ourselves, but this planet that we live on or else it's just going to crumble. So I would say that even extremely difficult trip can be unbelievably successful. Mind and, opening. Yeah. And with that, it leads us to my favorite part of the podcast and talking because this is a podcast about success and we do and not keeping success. up with the Joneses, yep, which is what you said earlier. <laughs> so we always like to celebrate people's successes. And so as a coach in psychedelics, I'm mm -hmm. sure you have daily successes uh, with people that you're coaching and stuff like that. But what's something recent that's happened in your life that you would like to publicly celebrate that is a success? It could be big or small, uh, but just something that has happened recently that's a big success for you personally. Oh, boy. That's hard to say. I'm someone who uh, works on myself pretty regularly, but I think that recently I've come to uh, not rely so heavily on the stories in my mind about what I think people think of or expect from me and realize mm. how many of my problems have to do with that. Mm. Mm. And also just cultivated a sort of a practice of being able to watch my thoughts as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think self-observation is very important. So those two things have helped me to considerably calm down and not be so upset by certain things. Mm. Uh, that's great. No, I love that. That's, yeah. that's huge success. Yeah. Huge. I mean, because it's so hard to control our thoughts. They are everywhere all the time. And um, last week when I was in uh, my conference, one of the speakers mentioned say, and said, Hey, just because you have a negative thought, doesn't mean you're a negative person, you know, because mm. we can't control our thoughts. Things will come in, come out. We just have to say, okay, I get it. I, I, I just thought that my mind thought that, but that does not mean that that's who I am. And a lot of people, when they think negative about something, they're like, oh, that's the person that I am. I am, you know, so mean, or I'm cruel. I'm a cruel person. And I love that you are constantly growing and working on yourself. Well, I think that also one thing I often tell clients when they come to me is we're not trying to get rid of uh, negative emotions and thoughts and things like that. We're trying to learn that we can coexist with them right? because mm -hmm. they're not going anywhere. The right. more you change, the more you try to fight off an emotion or a negative thought and get rid of it, it's not going anywhere. It's going to pop up. It's just a matter of knowing that you're still okay and yes. you don't have to believe that. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. love that so much. <laughs> Well, will you tell our uh, listeners where they can find you, where they can yeah. connect with you, where they can see stuff? From and, you? and also where uh, they can get coaching from you if, if they need um, if they need that in their life. Yeah, you can also you can always find me at psychedelic integration specialist dot com. Kind of a long URL, but I'm also Greg at psychedelic integration specialist dot com is my email. I'm psychedelic integration specialist on uh, 
Facebook, and you can find Greg Lawrence. I'm on Facebook too. And uh, psychedelic integration on Instagram. Perfect. That's awesome. We love it. <laughs> well, Greg, we appreciate your time. We yeah. appreciate you being with this us. This was sharing. so, I mean, you, we, we know some things, but you have just opened our mind even more and just taught us things that we don't know. And we are so grateful. Like I said earlier, keep doing it, keep doing what you're doing, change the world. That's what we're trying to do. And just, we, we celebrate you for doing that. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> wow, what a fabulous episode. He is just brilliant yeah. and made me think about so many things. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking about all the stigma that goes around, you know, I mean, we were we were born in the just say no, uh, the the dare, you know, the the war on drugs. Yeah, it I I don't even really necessarily consider these drugs as much. Uh, I, I feel like they're more medicines and I, I feel like that's a big way of how he described it. what he was talking about is that it's, it's medicine and yeah. that, that it's, it's, it's used, therapy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's counseling, it's therapy, uh, coaching, um, all of that rolled into one. Now I will say this, and I, I think it's important that we do say this. And mm-hmm. as he said, um, this isn't for everybody. Right. Don't go out and get a bunch of psychedelic drugs and just take them. Uh, be very careful with putting anything in your body that you yeah. haven't researched and haven't done any work. Yeah. On. Do your homework. Uh, make sure it's right for you. Talk to talk to other people. Reach out to people like Greg, coaches that can actually give you the knowledge and the information. Yeah, but also have an open mind when researching these things. Don't just just go and believe everything you've heard for all these years. Cause like Greg was saying, like there's so much misinformation out there that so many people just grew up thinking that this is the only thing that it is. And now they're missing out on opportunities to have real, real healing in their, in their minds and in their lives and in everything that they do. Yeah. So just love yourself always. If there's anything that you do need to work on and this, you, you might say to yourself that this is an option for you, then reach out to folks like Greg, reach out to us, reach out to anyone that you know, that, that has an open mind as well. And that can, it can guide you. Yeah. Um, with that, uh, we do want to remind you that there is a lot of more bonus content on our Patreon page. We've been working really hard on ramping that up. Mm-hmm. We've got video episodes of our podcast. So if you're listening to this right now, yeah. know that you could be watching it right. and seeing our, our smiling faces <laughs> and all of our kooky mannerisms and all that good stuff. I've got what I like to describe as ADD eyes. They're also always looking all over the place, but you would never know that if you don't watch our video <laughs> podcast. So jump over to patreon.com slash creative global. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get on there for $5 for yeah. $5, a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee a month. Yeah. It, in most places, that's less than a gallon of gas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and you, you could get bonus content. You can get uh, extra episodes. Mm-hmm. We do a thing called real talk where we just break it down and, yeah. and talk s- about real talk, you yeah. know, <laughs> say what's on our minds. And, um, we get, we get a little bit more, uh, in depth with some things on there. We've been doing some, uh, things around the house on mm-hmm. Patreon. So we've been, you know, highlighting some of the things that we're working on and yeah. So just, just join us over there and join our, join our family, our community, Um, We, like we say all the time, we have to have community and we have to have a family and you guys are part of it and you're part of our journey and we're part of your journey and uh, we wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Not to mention if you hate advertisements, uh, our Patreon is ad free. (laughs) So, uh, you know, on the podcast, we, we have advertisements because we're, you know, trying to sustain ourselves doing this and you know, it's important for us to explore those avenues. And mm-hmm. we apologize if you don't like those, but if you don't, then just jump over to Patreon for five bucks. Uh, you could get it without an ad and it, it'd be what you want it to be. And don't forget word of mouth is everything. If you like this podcast, if you've heard something that resonates with you, with someone that you may know, please let your friends know. 
We mm. are huge on word of mouth. So let them know the Reimagine Success podcast is right up their alley. Yeah. And also, if you use iTunes to use as a podcast player, please consider giving us a five star rating and a review that mm. helps tremendously with getting this out to more people. And also on Facebook, social media, you can also give us a five star review there as well. Yeah. So if, uh, if you don't know already, if you're not following us on social media at reimagine success pod, everywhere you go, reimagine success pod.com is our website. Um, you can email us at reimagine success pod at gmail.com. So reach out, be in touch with us. Mm -hmm. We love connecting with our listeners yeah. and share so your happy. successes with us. We love to hear your success stories. So mm -hmm. reach out to us on any of the social media platforms, reach out to us through Gmail, however you want to reach out. Um, I'm Melissa Lee Ellen on all social media and Jesse is just music. Jesse B on all social media as well. Yeah. We'd love to connect with you guys on a deeper level and get to know you some more. So do that and be a part of our reimagined success family. And we love you guys. With that, this is a Creative Global Podcasting production. Did you get motivated? Do you feel inspired? Don't worry about keeping up with the Joneses anymore. And don't forget to celebrate your successes every single day. Thank you for taking this journey with us. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Reimagine Success Pod. Email us at reimaginedsuccesspod at gmail.com and let us know what your successes are. Head over to patreon.com slash creative global for bonus and behind the scenes content. New episodes every Thursday at reimaginesuccesspod.com or your favorite podcast streaming platform. So let's change our mindsets and reimagine success. <laughs>